Okay. Uh, so welcome everyone. My name is Frank Quivetto. I'm the executive director of the South Fork Natural History Museum. And I want to welcome you all to a very, very important and uh, delightful presentation uh, that we have here this, this morning. Our program presenter is Dr. John Tanacredi. He's a professor of earth and environmental sciences at Malloy College, I'm sorry, Malloy University, and director of the Center of Environmental Research and Coastal Oceans Monitoring, better known as CIRCOM. And Dr. Tanacredi, a conservation biologist and expert on horseshoe crab ecology is here to report on the CIRCOM horseshoe crab Long Island inventory and the impact to this species by the COVID-19 pandemic. The title of today's program is what does horseshoe crab blood have to do with COVID-19? So John, I really appreciate the fact that you are here. Um, and I like thank to you, thank Frank. every, yep, I like to thank everybody who's joined us. And I just wanna let everybody know that John is now a co-host on this program. So if you have any questions, uh, write them in the chat, raise your hand, write them in the chat group uh, icon, and then John will answer them throughout his presentation. And uh, and we really want to really, really want to thank you for, for being here today, John. So take it away. Thanks so much. All righty. Thank you so much, Frank. Can everyone see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as Frank mentioned, uh, I am a professor at uh, Malloy University. Um, but just real quick, to kind of give uh, an idea of how uh, my involvement in my uh, in the last fifty years of my life have been not just in horseshoe crabs, but in conservation issues. I, I spent. Um, uh, three years in the United States Navy as a flight meteorologist flying in hurricanes of 1967 through 1970. Uh, was a environmental analyst with the United States Coast Guard, uh, then part of the Department of Transportation, still uh, to this day in that respect in bridge and highway construction, doing environmental impact statements to six states. Um, the, uh, I moved in 1970 eight to the National Park Service. I was a research ecologist with the National Park Service. I was duty stationed at Gateway National Recreation Area. And um, the, we, did a, we had the first cooperative program dealing with shoreline coastal national parks uh, from um, in the North Atlantic region, but also in uh, the East Coast of the United States. And it was a place where I was duty stationed uh, part of my time to the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography in Narragansett. So much of the horseshoe crab work that I was involved in um, had to do prior to coming, uh, I retired in 2001 in, uh, from the Park Service and um, went to, at the time, it was Dowling College in Oakdale, if you know where that is. And unfortunately it uh, uh, did not, make it past 2016. I left in 2013 to come to Malloy College and this past June, Malloy College is um, into university status now. And so CIRCOM as a center, <clears throat> this is our 20th first year. It's a center for environmental research, but it's coastal oceans monitoring. That's the key thing. Monitoring is really always the difficult portion in any kind of um, endeavor in getting the right amount of resources from volunteers to um, programmatic um, experience, infrastructure, boats, staff, a host of things, primarily because that's where the data is, needing to get out into the environment. And, um, and then certain, the pandemic created something that uh, wasn't in any case uh, near uh, the real problems that we face every year. Um, and of course, and that pandemic was a hundred year cycle in relationship to human population. But since the 1970s, um, these animals um, have uh, been involved in the preparation of the most sensitive and most important um, medical or, or pharmaceutical advance uh, for human health 
in a long, long time. I, I mean, it can be compared to the polio virus uh, detection and all of the, the idea dealing with uh, certain flu and influenza concerns. Um, there are a host of, of medical uh, concerns dealing with the medical profession at, at Malloy University. We, we have a major nursing school, uh, some 1500 nurses, uh, and they all know about limulus amoebocyte lysate, which I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, today. And um, since the 1970s, um, LAL has, has been important as a endotoxin detecting system. And I'll and clarify what that is at some point here, but the idea of finding about bacterial contamination, uh, even though the virus is, is a totally different um, organism, obviously, and viruses need living tissue, bacteria don't need to, to have living tissue in order to have impact on human health. Uh, and so the idea of gram negative bacteria getting into your circulatory or respiratory system produces something we call sepsis. And there is no cure for sepsis, literally. And you actually get it 207 in, in hospitals. 275,000 people in the United States alone die from sepsis. Uh, and it's a major, major public health concern. And that was way before uh, uh, the pandemic situation. So if, uh, unless there's a, a real immediate question, um, I'll get started in talking about Bochu crabs. So this presentation is not about dinosaurs. However, um, it might be able to pique your interest just as much as these animals are because dinosaurs are on the planet for about 150 million years. Uh, horseshoe crabs uh, were on the earth for 445 million years, just a little bit past the Cambrian period here and uh, as the age of invertebrates in, in paleo history. The, and why is that so significant? It's a significance because uh, in geological time periods over this uh, 500 million year time frame, there have been four massive, uh, I'm sorry, five massive extinction events. Uh, and one of them, 64 million years ago, um, the demise of all the dinosaurs was the most impressive one, primarily because um, it is from there that you and I have evolved to, and to this day. And it is that uh, in the KT boundary issue, horseshoe crabs are found all in the fossil record. They're found in, throughout this time period. And a host of other organisms have come and gone in paleo history. As a matter of fact, horseshoe crabs, which are arthropods, that basically they're related to insects, uh, spiders and scorpions, and, um, and sometimes crustaceans, though the crustacean society yells at me all the time, they don't include horseshoe crabs as a crustacean. But as you can see here, some of the paleo survivors, uh, you might've heard of trilobites. These are these individuals here. And in those early um, post-Cambrian oceans, the earliest oceans, which were very extremely primitive, these animals were predominant. Uh, as a matter of fact, New York State has a, a paleo uh, uh, organism, um, th this particular uh, precursor to um, scorpions uh, is, uh, is a, a big part of our fossil record. Eurypterids are the group that they're called, and you can see a couple of them here, but here's the horseshoe crab. And so um, one of the major evolutionary biologists um, in the world today, Niles Eldridge, um, has done a lot of work on trilobites. And he has always said that the, probably one of the major contributing factors to the survivability of this animal is the fact that it hasn't really changed much. As a matter of fact, if you took the paleolimuli and you take a look at um, the, some of these animals, I'm sorry, you take a look at some of these animals, and, and look at them today. If I put them right by you on a table somewhere, uh, you wouldn't uh, be able to tell the difference. Even I would have a little difficulty doing that. Uh, so they are um, another unique group of organisms. Uh, they are, again, related to arachnids, um, spiders and scorpions, but they're in their own uh, basic group, Meristomata, and in this phylum, Pelicerae are 
are animals that have um, their mouth parts surrounded by their legs. Um, and so this is a, they, and they have what are called chalicerae. And these are some of the trilobite pictures again. Um, and you can see they're also segmented. They have um, several portions where they may have their eyes and also the tail. And they do have, they don't have gills in the traditional types of gills, uh, but they do have, um, they either breathe right through their uh, exoskeleton or they have um, on horseshoe crabs, book gills. So here's all of them. The trilobites are gone. The chalicerae are still here. Arachnids and included crustaceans, lobsters, barnacles, and then this other group of, of uh, insects, groups of insects that are about. If you look down to the right hand here, uh, some of the characteristics uh, two compound eyes, but um, a host of, and some eight or nine on its telson and other parts of the body, and in the very uh, tops of what is called the prosoma. This is the prosoma. This is the epistosoma, it's a hinge here. Right in here is the heart um, and then uh, the telson. Those are the three main parts of the, what is called the carapace, the outer portion of this animal. It's an invertebrate, it grows by molting. And I'll go into that in a little detail. But the, the key here is the fact that they have primitive eyes, they're called ocelli. And why, why we, say they're primitive is that they basically detect the light intensity. It's a known fact that these animals uh, prefer to uh, spawn in the evening. They come ashore at in a high tide full moon. Females come ashore. Males attach to the females called amplexus. And once they get into somewhere between the low water and high water, within that area, sediment, muds, um, all types of beach profiles and beach uh, accumulations of sediment and material, then they will deposit eggs in, in the sand. And we'll talk about that, uh, um, that process in a moment. Again, the legs, they, they have two what are called pedipalps, smaller ones that move food into their mouth parts, a, a small beak here. Uh, and then they have two, uh, sw they have um, a, a 10, legs that are basically walking legs, but then there are two legs in the back that are for the, for the female very important because they basically excavate um, the, the nesting site when they burrow into the sediment. And that's important because the eggs need to be aerated and they are usually available in the upper three to five to six inches at most, depending on the size of the female. Um, Females are always larger than the males. That's called sexual dimorphism. And, but they burrow into the sand. And if they're left alone, they will deposit a certain number of eggs. And they usually do that deposition anywhere between three and seven times. Again, depending on the shoreline, the coastline, a host of variables that can influence uh, the nesting. So here, here's uh, mesolimuli, the earliest uh, known uh, Limulus, these are all fossilized remains, trilobites. And again, most of the trilobites that we, we collect um, have been, Niles Elders say they're mostly, um, and a colleague of mine in Japan, Yumiko Iwasaki, who has been doing a lot of work on trilobites, these are their molts usually. And more than likely, if you just didn't see any tracks next to the horseshoe crab, um, you would, this would probably be a molt as well. They got caught in a, um, in proper conditions for fossilization. Um, you go to the American Museum of Natural History, there's one little exhibit way in the back of the Marine Hall of a horseshoe crab track and uh, a fossilized remain that was collected um, in Canada. So, uh, but I don't think it does its justice, but that's another editorial comment. So we have a lot of this uh, fossilized remains, the trilobites. Horseshoe crabs, um, all, in many respects, uh, once they've become sexually mature, and this is the unique thing about these animals and another contributing factor, besides their simplicity, the idea of their uh, sexual process for reproduction and for spawning is spread out over a 10 to 11 year period. 
Uh, the male horseshoe crab will molt about um, uh, 16 times in a nine to 10 year period. Females will molt about 17 times uh, between a nine and 11 year period. So there is a, um, there's not much of a synchrony uh, in that mating process. So the males and females may not become sexually mature at the same time. Uh, but there are factors associated with that from an evolutionary standpoint that I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about once we get up onto the beach with them. But they have a host of other organisms. Once they're sexually mature, that means they've gone through the terminal molt. They're no longer molting. So there's a debate about that too. That some people believe that there are um, molts even after they've become sexually mature. And we've seen that in our laboratory. But the the um, there's a lot of animals and organisms that encrust them. So oyster drills, um, if, if you know anything about uh, Eurosalphinx, their eggs are, are always found on horseshoe crabs. Uh, the, the hard shell clams, cohogs, right? Um, certain warm, uh, worm species, um, bryozoans, these are the, the slipper shell, rapidula is tons of them on, I'll show you some pictures of them. And they have a, a symbiotic um, little organism um, I don't know much about them, though I know we find them on these animals. So um, there's a area for research. We don't think that they do much to reduce their health or anything, but they're basically found on um, horseshoe crabs. And on the outer portion, the vent ventral uh, dorsal portion, that was the ventral portion. Uh, you, again, you, you can see algae. Some of these get really covered. Uh, the older they get, the greater the probability that they'll have things growing on them. I've even seen, I've seen this, blue mussels, um, mitulus, edulis growing on them, the sponges, sea stars, um, oyster spat uh, possibility. I haven't seen it, but it, it, I'm sure that has been seen before. Uh, and definitely barnacles. Barnacles are, uh, will attach to anything in, in the ocean at this point. Anybody has a boat knows about that too. Again, here's the chalicerae. This is the, the, and the way that the difference between the male and the female is the first appendages. The first uh, legs or chalicerae uh, in the female are very wispy like this. In the male, they have a little hook. Uh, don't have a picture on here, but um, let me go back right here. Oh, they don't have it there either. Uh, I'll show you some pictures of that, but it's a tiny little hook. And why that's important is that the, fem the male will attached to the female, and the process is called amplexus. And it usually, uh, if you can see my little arrow, goes on to this portion, the epistosoma. And here's the groove where the, the, the blood of the horseshoe crab is gathered. Um, and this is where the heart is. And we'll kind of see, here's a compound eye, and then there's the, the primitive eyes. Um, the, the underside of it also includes these particular um, appendages, um, they're, they're called book gills. And under the book gills are the sexual organs, males and females producing, uh, females will produce between 80 and 120,000 eggs in a season. Uh, they usually, once they come ashore there and they nest and they find a proper location and they have a male attached, uh, which they usually do come ashore if they're in amplexus, they're, they're attached. And um, they deposit their eggs uh, in these nests, which are little divots in the, in the sand. I'll show you some pictures of those. And uh, then the eggs are deposited, usually four to six, maybe 10 maximum, 10,000 uh, eggs at a nesting. And then they do that four, five, six, seven times um, to uh, basically expel all of them. They can carry the, the females as I said, are larger, so they can carry eggs throughout their, their uh, prosoma. Uh, so it is pretty productive um, organism in producing um, eggs. Now, the history of horseshoe crabs is a bit torturous. Um, this is a picture taken in 1928 in Delaware Bay. This is a picture of a single season where 4 million horseshoe crabs were harvested for fertilizer. They were one of the major fertilizer contributing organisms in the 
early parts of the United States and, and they were just piled up and they were taken out, um, given to farmers and chopped up and that's what they did and the impact on them. So the numbers were immense and Delaware Bay is the epicenter for horseshoe crabs on the Atlantic coast. Uh, horseshoe crabs uh, breed and nest from Maine through down the East Coast around Florida, to just around about Tallahassee. And then on a certain portion, the tip of the Yucatan Peninsula. I'll show you a map uh, about that. And they're not found anywhere else, or at least they're not breeding anywhere else. Um, I was just down in, um, in the Bahamas uh, in uh, February, last February, and um, the, uh, there's a, at the Atlantis Hotel, I don't know if you've heard of the, this the hotel that's down there, but it's pretty immense. And they have probably the most amazing aquarium system that I've ever seen, largest one, bigger than some of the aquariums, like the Riverhead and, and the uh, Coney Island Aquarium. Uh, and they had a, a, a small little tank and um, I got one of the guides to bring me over to show me horseshoe crabs, knowing that I was involved with horseshoe crabs. And they probably got caught up in, in, a, in a current and maybe the Gulf Stream kind of whipped them around uh, to uh, be in, on the islands. But they only breed along the east coast of, they only spawn and breed along the east coast of the United States. And this is their, their habitat, this fragile edge we call barrier island, barry islands, which uh, basically protect the inner portions of the estuarine systems around Long Island and in New Jersey and down the coast. Estuary, Spartina marshes, these are the primary breeding grounds. Estuarine systems are the most productive ecosystems on the planet, more productive than any coral reef system, more productive than agricultural systems, and they get subsidized by the natural functioning of the tide systems and the idea of sediments. Sediments in estuaries are critically important. And why they're important is for not only the decomposition of all of the plant material and all of the, but they're breeding grounds. And they're basically nursery grounds where 90% of all finfish and shellfish in the Atlantic Ocean, anything that comes around and near comes into the estuary will breed and generate inside estuarine systems, you name it. You name the species they usually have from finfish to shellfish um, and, um, and all of the larger predators, uh, whether it's marine mammals or what have you, all use um, nursery, the nursery grounds of estuarine systems as they're feeding and raising their young. So it's that dynamic portion of Long Island. And uh, I have to make an editorial comment. Um, the last decade or so, you probably, if you're reading the newspaper or listening on the news, you hear all of these in crisis associated with Long Island's coastal environment. And oh, we don't, we have um, hypoxia here, and we have a, 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 a tidal bloom here, and we have a fish kill here. Um, I can tell you, um, I've lived in New York all my life, and I can tell you that the ecological robustness and health of our coastal environment, this near shore environment, this entire portion included from the Hudson River estuary out into what is called the Bight, the New York Bight, the south shore of Long Island, out to Peconic Bay and Long Island Sound is incredible. We, we, uh, we see Menhaden bunker off the charts. We see humpback whales breaching right in New York Harbor underneath the Verrazano Bridge. I've been on right off the, the New York, uh, Breezy Point and Sandy Hook coastline. So the whale populations are up. Out, out in Cupsog, seals, tons of seals out there. Health, that dealing with fisheries, dealing with uh, the numbers of, of animals that are associated with natural history. So it's really important to keep in mind that it, crises make the front pages of newspapers and, and in the media. But the idea is, as a scientist, we have to really look at natural phenomena and look at things that are changing all the time. The, the idea of environmental conditions, the idea of, of tidal conditions, the idea of seasonal conditions, all contribute to some kind of response in the environment, either uh, in a positive way or sometimes will, will be perceived as a negative, negative way um, in these, these environments. The coastline is an amazing place. Um, Walt Whitman, you know, wrote about it all, all the time about going on, 
to winter beaches. The idea of observing the shoreline is of critical importance for uh, animals like horseshoe crabs. Uh, again, the most of the productivity you won't see. You don't you see horseshoe crabs coming about, but they graze on shellfish and on worms and other types of benthic species. It's the benthos that's critically important. Uh, generally, uh, as a scientist who, who worked in, in benthic ecology, I worked on hard shell clams for my uh, PhD and soft shell clams for my master's degree. And each, each time you're working in mud, you're working in places that are anoxic most of the time. They're, they're basically the whole idea of denitrification systems take place in wetlands and marshes and sediments. And without these systems, the oceans would be in trouble. And so there are this type of, here's a, a picture of the Spartina marshes uh, off of uh, the Jersey shore. And so it is this type of ecosystem, this intense um, marsh uh, filtering system all along the coastline is what is now, and I'm hoping will continue into the next decade, a, a new um, perspective on, on conservation biology. And that is basically trying to recreate or bring back the living coastline, not just putting rock jetties, not just putting sand, is putting plants back in that can help not only from photosynthetic standpoints, but also in bioproductivity. But they're also important because this is the habitat for horseshoe crabs. And here's a couple of divots along the sand. And it's not a, like a beach sand type of thing. It is a sandy um, uh, shoreline. But I use the term shoreline because the shoreline can take a whole host of different um, attributes depending on everything from shell debris. If you ever walk along the shore, you know about the rack line. You know where the rack line comes up to uh, the high tide. High tides change all the time. You have spring tides that are higher, the highest of high tides. You got neap tides, which are the lowest of, of, uh, of the tidal cycle. And that, is, depending on where you are, uh, and certainly here in New York, we're semi-diurnal. That's every six hours you have a high tide so and, and a low tide. It's coming in and out on a six-hour six cycle. So that is linked to weather and other conditions that help um, perpetuate the habitats for these animals. But not this, not the, the jetties, the rock riprap, which is important to prevent erosion. But this is really uh, um, will not allow animals to move in and about. Uh, and that is really a, a lot more of attention to um, shoreline stabilization. Here's a mud flat looking at a, a female in the mud flat. Once the, the male attaches to the female in amplexus, as it is called, um, that male will hold on quite a bit. Uh, each time it deposits a certain amount of eggs, it will deposit sperm to fertilize it. And in this slurry inside the nest, that, that burrowing that the, the, the female has done. And that's important ecologically because you, you, the, it's called bioturbation. You have to turn over sediments to get whatever sur surface organic material is the nutrients of estuary. If you look at our waters on Long Island, you can't see down too far. And a lot of people say, oh, that, that water clarity is a problem. It's, no, it's not, it's not a problem. And actually it's a benefit. If you go to the Caribbean and you go to the Mediterranean uh, where I've spent a lot of my time in my research area, um, you, can, you can look down you know, so, uh, 20 feet, 30 feet, uh, even more than that, because it doesn't have the nutrient load that is found in these temperate climates in estuaries. It's that nutrient contribution that helps the productivity and the plant growth and the, the whole food chain food web dynamics, go back to ecology 101, that happens inside estuaries. That's critical. So looking at the, the, um, the horseshoe crab here, Every single one of those uh, couples will now have some competition from a host of what are called satellite males. All of these are males coming about trying to either remove the male that's attached to the female or get underneath the female to flip them over so that the male will let go and then they can attach. So it's a, it's a kind of a, a competitive aspect of these animals in order to 
contribute, and every single one of these satellite males will at one point get to that nest and deposit sperm. And that is the main reason for their overall um, survivability and productivity. Because the idea is there's a tremendous amount of diversity in the genetics that are associated with these animals. Um, this is the uh, one, it's called Slaughter Beach. It's in Delaware. And Delaware is the epicenter for Limulus polyphemus, the North, uh, the, uh, American, North American horseshoe crab. It's literally millions of them will come ashore there. And they've been doing that uh, time immemorial for as long as they've been uh, identified. And um, females come across first. Um, they may be with a, a, a male or not, but this is amplexus. And you can tell the maturity of the female based upon this, this reproductive scar. Uh, as the male comes in, it's, it's attached to the epistosoma and it makes this scar on the female so that you, you know that this is a mature female who has reproduced before. And, and here's, a, here's a nest, so it, it's trails, it came out of there and now it's nesting again. And it will do that in a, in a particular area. If this animal survives to the next year, it may very well come back to the same location. Um, they, they have a good level of site fidelity. That doesn't mean that there aren't animals that don't go some distance. Some animals have been tagged from um, Georgia and, and uh, Florida and have been come up to the Chesapeake uh, or from the Chesapeake and been found up in Maine. But very, very few. Majority of the animals do come back to their same location, which lends itself to certain things. We, we did a, a study um, uh, here Sir Comets in my latest book on horseshoe crabs at Springer Nature, um, had a student who did a spectacular job. Um, she's at BU right now in graduate school. Um, the work had to do with taking, um, this is the computer technology part here, um, Google Earth taking pictures, satellite pictures of sites on Long Island and looking at them from the 1970s um, or 1980s through to the 2010s. And sure enough, you get to see all of the places where horseshoe crabs were seen 10, 20 years ago, are not seen today, it's primarily because the habitat has changed. Either it is eroded or there's development or um, there's a change in the current. So there's a host of things that contribute to that uh, process. So these are just some pictures of, of the crabs, a lot of the fouling, um, portions here like barnacles uh, and just the numbers of crabs coming ashore. And, and they uh, sometimes, I mean, they are, um, uh, they may be depositing um, the, uh, if they, it's in the sediment, if the female's in the sediment, but uh, this, is, this is all contribution of the nutrient richness of the shoreline. Here's a picture of uh, molt, right? the individual crawling out and molting process is amazing. Um, this is the bottom look, here's some, the connection of um, a male to a female. Um, you can just about see, I think it's right about here, this kind of hook, which is the, the male attaching on. And then here's one, a single clutch. Um, this is maybe, uh, again, um, 10,000 uh, individual little green sand, as they're called uh, along the beach. It's about 21 days of maturation, development for Limulus. And by the time they get around about three weeks or so, you can see their compound eyes, you can see their telson, uh, and you can start to see the differentiation between the epistosoma and the prosoma. And it's, a, it's an amazing process to see these guys because they actually molt inside their egg. There are four molts that are pre-hatching, and then they hatch to a juvenile, and then the juvenile is in the sediment and around the sediment. They don't migrate too far. They don't go out into deep ocean, uh, and then they develop over the next month or so. And a lot of those juveniles are lost. A lot of the eggs are lost. Um, birds feed on them. Turtles feed on them. Fin fish feed on them all types of animals and organisms feed on them. And if they're allowed to remain in, in the wild, it's gonna be taking between 10 and 12 years before they're sexually mature. So this is a, 
what's amazing is that these animals have been able to survive for 445 million years in this same process. The process hasn't changed. It's just the idea of the environment in, uh, has, has changed, which it does all the time. So here's another picture. Here's a, another shot of the, the, the eggs. Again, the four molts inside the egg itself. Uh, again, these are found only on the east sides of continents. Here's a limulus, only found here. There are three other species. Uh, two of them are called Tachypleus, and one is called Carcinoscorpius. Carcinoscorpius is only found in the Bay of Bengal, uh, though they do find some along uh, the Indonesia, Malaysia, around the Philippines, up into mainland China, um, the Korean coastline, Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, up into Taiwan, and then they stop right about here. And then across the waters to Japan. Um, I, I said Korea, Korea's up here. So it's not, that's uh, where they are right now. Only on the southernmost island of Japan, uh, where the, the um, predominant species, invertebrate species is um, the horseshoe crab, Pachypleus gigas. And we'll see what that looks like in a minute. At the same, this is, um, a, it's, um, in my time teaching ecology or learning about ecology, um, certainly um, I was kind. I was uh, treated to having uh, met Howard Odom. Uh, I mean Eugene Odom, the Odom brothers at the University of Georgia, were the, kind of the epitome of ecologists. Um, and their classic textbook on on ecology talked about synchrony of migrating organisms. Well, here's a perfect, you know. Uh, uh, wildebeests in the Serengeti, uh, African elephants, uh, um, whales, uh, all migratory. But here, when the horseshoe crabs start coming across up in the spring and in, onto the shoreline, um, it's synchronized with all the birds that are, are there, many of them migratory, certainly red knots, ready turnstones, uh, but all kind of shorebirds are, are there. Here's some laughing gulls, um, there's some Red knots, ruddy turnstones there, sandalings, uh, plovers. Uh, and, and it's just an amazing scene. If you get down to Delaware, and walk along the shoreline and Southern New Jersey down to Cape May, this is what you'll see. And you'll notice that a lot of these are dead crabs. The crabs come up and they die. There's a natural mortality. They get caught up in the winds and the waves and storm conditions or changes in weather. Take a look at our weather in the, in the last two weeks and you can see ch changes. Winds peaking at, at 40, 50 knots the other day and then going from uh, 29 degrees to 55 degrees. So all types of variability. And as an ex-meteorologist, I appreciate that. It just it gets, it doesn't get translated because it's, it's, it's something that you have to really look at over long periods of time. These changing shorelines do have this synchrony, birds and the horseshoe crabs, but it's not just only their eggs, certainly not because even up in this area here, if this was, unless this was under high tide at one point, most of those eggs will be below the surface. They get caught up in the storms and waves and, and brought up onto the surface, so they may be available, uh, but it, does count in some respects on how many animals there are. And to this day, we have really have a, a wide range, somewhere between eight and 12 million horseshoe crabs that uh, have been identified offshore, which is, means we, we really don't know. But here's some other pictures, red knots there, and egrets, I mean, you name it. And, and certainly look at this, this is not a sandy beach, it's a cobble beach. So the animals are along the shore. I just always love this shot because this is uh, I, this was shot in Jamaica Bay. So I don't think Brooklyn had anything to do with it, but it definitely has a lot of encrusted organisms. And you can see here, this is a group with slipper shells. Again, these these have not molted; otherwise, these wouldn't be here. Um, so when you see a very clean shell, that means that they're either still um, have not reached sexual maturity, but they are adults and that they may not even reproduce. 
the only way to know that is on this, the uh, reading groove here on the Pistasona. Just a, a few pictures. Um, so what do we do at CIRCOM? Uh, again, this is our 21st year, 10 of those. Uh, this is our 10th year at uh, Malloy University, formerly Malloy College. And uh, we measure across the prosoma, across the eyes of the animals that we see. We, we identify if there's a breeding groove. So this is a female. And again, females, due to their biology, are always larger than the males. Uh, and they are, that's sexual dimorphism in this animal. It could be uh, uh, given a tag. Uh, usually this is done out of the limulus, I mean, out of, um, uh, Linnaean society, literal, uh, literal um, society, all of the uh, uh, NGO kind of groups uh, and a lot of citizen science marking and, and tagging. It's all important, all it's very good uh, opportunities to include them. Uh, here's a tag team ultimate. Um, but there's also an interesting aspect of this animal and its survivability is that it's a, a bycatch. It's part of uh, any nesting and, and trawling situation. Here, spider crabs, winter flounder, uh, and here's the horseshoe crabs, and there's blue claws. So th these are th two million animals, over a, a million, 1.2 million animals, uh, horseshoe crabs are removed by bycatch along the Atlantic States. Um, and the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission is the group that monitors this. They have representatives from all the states and they, they put down the, the paradigm the, for managing these animals. And, uh, and to this day, they still have indicated that um, the majority of the population um, in the East Coast is good. The only state that has a poor rating I'm afraid, is New York. And uh, that's a whole other discussion and point of view, but it is identified as, um, as a matter of fact, in, there used to be a time when 250,000 animals were allowed to be harvested for bait in New York. That's been reduced to 135,000. Uh, but the issue is, why do we have to have this bait? The bait industry, for this being used for bait, is for conch and eel. These are niche fisheries. I'm not against conch and eel fisheries. The idea is that they, the indication has always been that it, without um, the female horseshoe crab, which is you know basically a protein um, collection with all of its eggs, if it's gravid, and if it's coming ashore, it, it will be, and if it's caught early enough by in a net, it will be, and generally the bait industry, um, the fishermen are collecting them to get them into uh, bait shops by collecting them offshore, and they don't get a chance to come into the shoreline. So again, these are, these are stipulations that are not um, an aspect. These are kind of unintended consequences of looking at a program to try to manage the overall population on the Atlantic coast of the United States. And if you looked at the, at the other three species, they're in even worse shape because in Asia, in the, the, that part of the world, they eat horseshoe crabs. They use them in the food, um, basic culinary aspect. It is a whole website called Exotic Foods and they have horseshoe crabs there. They use the carapace for a, a bowl. Uh, and so, and that hasn't changed actually. I, I remember this 20, 30 years ago, but it was, it was kind of, a minor issue. No one ever thought that it would kind of explode the way it is, but um, these animals, uh, we even had an incident at Kennedy Airport where 600 horseshoe crabs from um, Vietnam were shipped into the United States. That cannot be done anymore, uh, but uh, I got a phone call from Fish and Wildlife Service saying, you take a look at this picture. We did this uh, was just brought in on an airplane coming in and, and I said, well, it has a phone number on it in Vietnam. Give me that phone number. We took the phone number and made a phone call. And we said, uh, 
you know, it wasn't easy, but we got through. And the fellow said, uh, yeah, how many horseshoe crabs do you want? We, you can use them for bait. And so we sold them to you. But it was sitting there smelling like we knew that it was there uh, at Kennedy Airport. And uh, we put that in our, our last book on horseshoe crab research over the last uh, two decades. And it says you know, where there's an audience, there will be a way today to communicate to get this uh, back here. And those were being used for bait. They weren't being used for food. But you know, I've, I've been to parts of the world where you, you move to the shoreline. You, I was on Easter Island. They eat sea urchins. This is just like they do in many island archipelagos through the Pacific. And um, they're doing that all the time, you know. And so this is a is an issue. It might be a side issue. It may not be that all that big, big, but it comes down to here in the United States using horseshoe crabs as bait, primary bait for conch and eel, which are not big fisheries associated. These are niche fisheries. We're not talking about striped bass, bluefish, winter flounder, summer flounder. We're not even talking about shellfish, which these animals feed on. We're talking about the idea of taking these and shipping to, to, to Asia or to a, a one population for its consumption. These are the eyes, the compound eyes. A Nobel Prize was won by a scientist studying um, the eyes. And then, so all, up to this point, um, everything is biological, ecological, and now we get to the human health. And um, CIRCOM is the only captive breeding program for horseshoe crabs, not only in the United States, but in the Western Hemisphere. There's only one other academic institution, <laughs> excuse me, that does a captive breeding of horseshoe crabs, and that's City University of Hong Kong. And they produce about 70,000 juveniles a year. Um, we produce about between 10 and 20 juveniles, but they're allowed to uh, return all of their juveniles and fertilized eggs into the Hong Kong Harbor. Uh, we are not allowed uh, under permit uh, to release any animals that are kept in a laboratory. That's a, other, that's a whole other um, PowerPoint presentation because uh, the, the, uh, we're not really sure why that should be, but that is where it is. We, we do have something called the Crab Club. We give um, about anywhere between uh, 500 and 1,000 eggs uh, to high schools and junior high schools. Um, we have about, we have more than 18 now. We have close to 26. That was just before the pandemic. That kind of slowed down a bit. Um, and they raise them and then they bring back the juveniles to the laboratory at the end of the school year. Uh, we have one high school on Long Island that uh, has an animal that has gotten to uh, six years, which is um, Absolutely amazing. We don't even have that happening in our laboratory. So um, what's the, the issue about the blood? So, so horseshoe crabs are harvested um, along the Atlantic coast. The only state that does not harvest horseshoe crabs for bait, uh, but all there are many states that harvest horseshoe crabs to contribute to producing limulus amoebocyte lysate which is, uh, comes from the blue blood of horseshoe crabs. Blue blood, uh, meaning that they're basically copper-based when they uh, get into the air, just like our blood is red when it gets into the, in, it's oxygenated. Um, the production of LAL um, is, a, is a big industry. And the, but take a look at what LAL does. LAL is an immediate testing regime to determine those gram-negative bacteria and the idea of the potential for contamination in resulting in sepsis or some kind of contamination. NASA uses LAL to spray, used to, uh, we don't have the space shuttle now, but on when the space shuttle is putting satellites up, certain satellites like weather satellites have to be coated in a thin veneer of gold. And that gold cannot get contaminated. If you ever saw pictures of the NASA scientists working on sat on satellites going onto the space shuttle, they're in all kind of gear that we take for granted today in hospitals for COVID. But they would spray LAL, and if there's any contamination, that would give you 
four readings in, in the airless places of space. Um, this is, uh, it was used by, by NASA as well. But it, it, between 2009, 2015, just in that one period, and that has gone up much more, there were 3.95, 3,950,000,000 million medical prescriptions dispensed uh, all, and every single one of those medical prescriptions, 3.95 billion, are subject to quality control testing, just as all the testing of the billions, seven, eight billion inoculations associated with several, three or four different COVID-19 uh, immunizations that were dispensed and available and are still available in treating COVID. It is that quality control, quality assurance that is done with an endotoxin detection, detecting system like LAL and mostly with LAL. As a matter of fact, there's a host of other groups that have been trying to use synthetic LAL, mimicking it and making it just like it made uh, out of petroleum products, uh, but it is, it is not approved by the FDA. It is not utilized uh, in, in the United States. It is used in other places in, in Europe and what have you, but none of them, none of them have ever reached the point where the Food and Drug Administration says this is absolutely equivalent to LAL from horseshoe crab blood. The total number of surgeries estimated uh, in the United States, uh, I'm sorry, on a global scale is over 230, almost 235 million surgeries. Anyone who's gone through surgery, every single instrument, every single hospital, uh, surgical room, uh, every single every single doctor associated had to have making sure that there's no bacterial contamination. Uh, the And um, being a type two diabetic, um, I know that, that is, we get, uh, and those people who have type one diabetes have to take you know, insulin shots. That may be changing. I'm, I'm not up to speed on, on, the, on the, the curatorial aspect of that, but the key is um, detection and blood sugar and all types of, of instruments, whether it's an inoculation or a, a medicine. It, it is all of that has to be detected as a quality control, quality assurance. So it is basically life saving message with public health. The previous testing, and only, um, only about a decade or so ago, that this was officially abandoned was called a rabbit test. And anybody in, in the audience here uh, might have heard of it. Uh, basically, they would take rabbits. And they would, um, when I was, I was in uh, graduate school at uh, my courses in toxicology, we worked with uh, rabbits and laboratory rats and, and we would put things on their skin or, or have them breathe in things or, and th these are test animals. Now, as, as uh, pol politically incorrect that might be today, bottom line is this had to do with public health. And so the, the rabbits, unfortunately, um, if they succumb to anything or they were impacted by anything, it would take 72, 48 to 72 hours to get a result. LAL is instantaneous and it's 99.99% effective and efficient. These rabbit tests were definitely crude and antiquated and LAL has basically eliminated the rabbit test. Uh, and so today, horseshoe crabs are bled about a third of each of the, the you get more blood from the female because they are larger and that's basically the thing uh, they take about a third of their blood this is equivalent to you giving blood every year no different except they don't get a cookie and a, and a, and a glass of orange juice and they're put back into um, a liter of, of the blood is then spun down and this product is produced um, I have, I don't have a picture of it, but I have a tiny little vial of LAL here um, that uh, and all of our nurses know all about it. You can see the my hand there. And so the, the, this is a very important um, product at this point. Uh, the, right now, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of um, 
half a million, 500,000 total, uh, but uh, depending on where they're harvested from. And there's a quota. The Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission provides, uh, there used to be uh, males and females in Delaware Bay, uh, but three, four years ago, um, it was changed so that there are no females collected as a, as a way to help protect um, overall population of horseshoe crabs in Delaware Bay. And then the key here, and this has been always my kind of mantra all along, the impact on horseshoe crabs from bleeding, my professional opinion is insignificant. It is not even as there's a overall population value of about 15% of, of all the animals. That, that's even lower than, um, it's, it's not even higher than the natural mortality that's estimated depending on where you are and at what time of year. But what is critical of these two charts here? One is um, the abundance of, uh, and the landings of American eel along the Atlantic coast. Notice this chart here, the landings have had in the 1970s through the 1980s were, were robust and that they've been declining ever since. This only goes up to about 2014, 15, but notice this chart here, this value. And this is a, a critical end result of the fishing mythology in many respects. This is. Basically, the idea of fishing is, is maintaining um, a uh, income and, and, and it's very important and, and I support it all the time. I, I've, I've gone clamming, I've gone crabbing, I've um, gone fishing in my lifetime and uh, I was very fortunate that I, I was able to experience it. I didn't have to depend on it and it's, it's important to depend on it. And, uh, but the a fishing philosophy is that even if it's in small supply, I, you know, if I catch it within the quota, I'm allowed to take them. But here's the, the concern. The concern is that the value of the American eel has skyrocketed and it's shipped outside of the United States. And that therefore there's an incentive to continue to harvest American eel. And that's become an issue with the uh, Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, and they're looking at that as well as horseshoe crab abundance as well. Uh, there's always a little bit of a myth that you can't hold these animals by their tail. Well, we're not flinging them around, but these two very excited um, high school students were helping out with the project. They were just holding it up. They shouldn't, but you shouldn't really do that. And they do get caught up in a lot of uh, debris along the shoreline. I mean, you, you probably hear quite a bit today about plastic, um, and that is certainly uh, a problem. And this animal would, would, uh, uh, would succumb fairly quickly with all of this attachment. There are abnormalities in these animals, just like any animal on the planet. Um, no one knows what the, the effect is, but I've seen this a few times in a kind of a malformed um, uh, telson. If you ever see a horseshoe crab like this, that's what the tail is for, to turn itself over. If it doesn't turn itself over, you can help it by turning it over. Just flip them, put them back in the water because, <coughs> excuse me, being outside of um, the water, um, there, the, here's where their hook gills are. And if they dry out, more than likely the animal will be, will be a mortality. But it's also very vulnerable here. It doesn't have the protection of the of the prosoma uh, against birds like gulls and shorebirds, you show that egret, they'll come along and they'll peck away at this animal and basically they'll they predate on it. So um, CIRCOM is, again, the key is the M word, uh, monitoring. So we've been looking at uh, certain water quality parameters in Great South Bay and just in the Great South Bay area, we have seen, again, those crisis words don't apply. pH is relatively st stable over the last 20 years in, in our monitoring. And dissolved oxygen levels tabulated between 2009 and 2022 
in many respects are off the charts. Not only surface dissolved oxygen, but bottom dissolved oxygen, which is even more important because benthic regions or sediments below the first two or three inches in the sand or muds are anaerobic. And that's important in, in what is called denitrification processes in the estuary, which is a function, a physical chemical function of estuarine systems in the nitrogen cycle. So this is very positive. We see, and, and why that's positive is where it's contributed from. We hear all these negative things about blooms, but every spring all plants bloom. That's the important part about this. And that's the critical aspect of the estuary. Now, if the blooms are certain types of uh, organisms that are counter to um, the uh, overall quality of the water, uh, in, in depending on how close it, it gets to the shoreline, or if the bloom conditions are have a toxicity to them, like a red tide, but red tides are very infrequent. As a matter of fact, there's only been one or two in the last decade, and, and there was one in New Jersey. Th those are very unique circumstances, but it's not some evil behind a door waiting to come out uh, every year. Th there is no indication that the quality of and it's from water quality, Great South Bay. I've looked at other uh, monitoring systems throughout Long Island Sound, Peconic Bay. Peconic Bay is, is amazing. It, it doesn't have the full blown impact from uh, contributing factors that, that are like in more developed parts of Long Island. Um, and certainly in New York and Jamaica Bay, I spent 30 years looking at Jamaica Bay waters. They're incredibly productive, robust, and um, this is all due to the typical food chain dynamics of phytoplankton blooming, and then organisms that feed on phytoplankton. The herbivorous fishes like menhaden or bunker, their numbers are off the charts the last 10 years. And that reason is important because bunker is the primary food on humpback whales. And that's what you see. We see them breaching out the feed. Humpback whales produce these bubble nets. They come up to the surface. It's an amazing sight. If you have a chance to take a, a whale watch out of, out of Montauk or out of um, New York, out of the city uh, in Rockaway, Gotham Whale or Cressley and the Viking fleet out east, take it. Take a look at the whale populations. They're just off the charts. Hundreds of dolphins and uh, porpoises all over. So. This we, we see, we have reinforced the concept of ecological quality in Great South Bay. Now, that, that is something that has to be maintained. So if it's changed by development or some other aspect associated, more dredging or whatever might be associated with it, um, then that has, there has to be statements about it. What's the biggest issue on Long Island right now? If you have to have something to look at, what, what it's, you know, all it says is it's positive. Let's take a look at what's happening in the wind development aspect offshore. That is a major, major uh, issue that needs to be intensely uh, watched and to be as skeptical as possible in making sure that um, it doesn't create the kinds of concerns that um, we're really worried about in the quality of our environment on Long Island. Um, chemical uh, ocean uh, acidification is a little bit um, related to uh, what goes on on any particular island and certainly in the ocean. Uh, there has been a collective attention to a, a slight um, increase in ocean acidity. Um, but what the, the effects of that might be, um, we did in a couple of experimental projects looking at uh, horseshoe crabs. And uh, we looked at the Great South Bay top and bottom salinity. We looked at the Great South Bay pH changes, as you can see here, pretty stable over from 2005 to 2022. And we looked at that dissolved oxygen, a couple of dips around 2014 and 15, right after Sandy. Uh, but the numbers are, are pretty robust. And um, then they're at and above what would be considered uh, excellent 
dissolved oxygen values in top and, surf and surface waters. That's at around anything at or above five milligrams per liter. And these are average values. So, so um, that's, that's very impressive when you have these high average values. These are increasing. But what does that have to do with horseshoe crabs? Uh, and again, the, the reason for the protection or the understanding of these quality concerns for the horseshoe crabs is whether or not um, they're going to survive. And if we still have the bait situation going on, um, how long that can continue to be uh, maintained. Uh, two things that we have found that there's been a slight increase in the numbers of locations that don't have for three years in a row any indication that there are horseshoe crabs breeding there. Now, this has a big error bar. And so uh, it just needs to be part of the discussion. What is happening at each of the 115 locations, I'm sorry, 115 locations that we monitor from the tip of Brooklyn to the tip of Montauk as to why they may not have horseshoe crabs identified there, either in some of their nesting sites, any of their molts, any of the, any eggs in the sediment, uh, or any adult crabs in and around high, high tide, full moon, and new moon. Those are the basic parameters. And then we make sure that um, we look at those, all those variables as well. And we also have a connection on an international scale, uh, because again, there's only four species of horseshoe crabs on earth, and is with the IUCN. Uh, I'm a, an inaugural member of the scientific specialty committee. It's called an SSG, scientific specialist group for the IUCN, International Union for the Conservation of Nature. It's the largest conservation group on earth. And it basically maintains something called a red list. <laughs> and the red list is, is identifies the, what's the condition, uh, survivability of these animals. And it is based upon biodiversity and uh, biological the quality of the environments that they're in. Horseshoe crabs have issues. Uh, in Taiwan, uh, where horseshoe crabs are called the husband and wife, Crab because they have horseshoe crabs associated with every wedding event, believe it or not. Uh, they captively breed the animals. They actually build buildings around their wetlands. They cordon off locations to take horseshoe crabs and uh, make sure that they get to adult size. And they have a whole aquarium where the whole wing, the largest aquarium in the world is in Southern Taiwan. And it has a whole wing just on horseshoe crabs. And the, this uh, motley crew here are, are the scientists that we've been working together for over 25 years on horseshoe crabs. Mark Botton, formerly retired from Fordham University, Paul Shin and S.G. Chang from uh, Hong, City University, Hong Kong. Uh, Dave Smith from USGS, uh, U.S. Truly in the shorts. And um, uh, uh, Glenn Gauvery from ERDG in Delaware, which is the epicenter for horseshoe crab information, uh, go to their ERDG website and you'll get all kinds of information on full scale of horseshoe crab work. This is the Hong Kong lab, uh, pretty impressive. This is some of our, I put our, our animals in there as well. We now have pools that simulate the shoreline and this is a single clutch. Um, here's a, uh, single spawn and you can see that there another spawn in a different tank getting into the larvae we feed the juveniles um, so, uh, brine shrimp and we get the animals as they approach the seventh or eighth instar that's the numbers of molts remember there are four molts inside the egg and then they have to get from male 16 and female 17. And for some reason, we get the animals up to the 10th molt and we have mass mortality. So we're not really sure what that's about. Uh, they need a little bit, that, that's another area that we looked at. Had the same thing happen in, in the major aquarium in, in Taiwan, um, but we haven't really 
figured that out yet or gotten some indications of it and spent my sabbatical last semester doing that. These are the 115 locations on Long Island. If you're interested in horseshoe crab monitoring, you can let us know. And if there's a, a site, these are all GPS. And if there's a site that's in your backyard or near you and you'd like to help out this coming summer, uh, just send us over and we'll, uh, you'll talk to my tech and the tech will, will uh, get you onto a schedule. Uh, we have students usually doing this and uh, the tech. And during the pandemic, uh, yours truly uh, got uh, recruited into getting into the, we, we never missed a year. Every year, um, one year was a little low, uh, but we never missed a year in monitoring water quality and um, horseshoe crab sites. These are some of the sites. Ah, is the physiology. Here's what I was talking about, the male's hook on the first appendage. This female looks like that, the male's looks, looks like that. The number of horseshoe crabs, um, numbers sometimes are misleading. Um, every species of animal that has gone extinct has had major numbers in their population. It depends on what is happening in this time. Now, again, we're talking about an animal that's been on for hundreds of millions of years. What is it that is, is happening on Long Island? Our indication is that the numbers are declining. Now, um, there, are, there are qualifiers to that. Um, we look at things post, usually um, late May, very early June, the first full moon, new moon in May, and then June, July, and then in the beginning of August. Now, they come ashore at least two or three weeks earlier. So there may be um, animals here. There may even be eggs here. But that's intensive to look at all of these sites. Um, there are quite a few people. Um, Cornell is, is certainly looking at sites. You may be involved with that at some point. Uh, all of the collection sites uh, need to have not only animals, but egg production, egg density. And, um, and then again, uh, animals don't just come one time and leave. They, they may uh, repeat several times up on the beach. So <clears throat> not double counting is another issue. Um, and then what these beaches, if they were sites that were far enough away or close enough rather to um, trawling, or they're all on the shoreline. Uh, so there's a host of things. I, I, I've seen uh, restaurants um, taking horseshoe crabs near their beach and putting them up on to sell or whatever they might do with them. But the key is that the numbers are not as robust as they might have been in the early 2000s. And so there needs to be more attention. To that. And as I mentioned, uh, declining in the number of sites. To give you an idea, again, every site, if you looked at every site of these 115 that we're looking at, no site has a, a, a trend. There's this kind of up and down um, population density aspects. So just take a look at these four or five slides real quick here to show you each of the size of the, the uh, circle, colored circle here, tells you numbers of animals and uh, when they were done in what year. And I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly. So that's a, a variable that needs to be looked at. IUCN, as I mentioned, has the scientific specialty group um, and uh, Mark Bott and Paul Shin are the chairs and I'm on the steering committee and we are planning a, another, we just finished uh, in 2019, just before the pandemic, believe it or not, in mainland China, a, uh, the uh, fifth international horseshoe crab conference. And I just finished just in 2022, publishing and editing the conference proceedings, 50 papers and publications from around the world uh, more and more scientists interested in horseshoe crabs, even though these animals are not distributed everywhere. 
You don't find them on the west coast of the United States. You don't find them in Europe. Um, but th this is a the scientific um, investigative aspect is, is building, and, and there are more and more students and um, researchers interested in them. This is the first book on the first international conference uh, published horseshoe crabs. As you can get most of this from Springer. Springer Publishes, Springer Nature, Springer Science, um, if you're interested in that. And you can, there's a host of, or, there's thousands of organisms, unfortunately, red listed by IUCN. The process is, this is the process or the result. Horseshoe crabs, Limulus is right here, vulnerable within this threatened category. Uh, I would hate to see them getting too critically endangered, but uh, Two million a year being pulled out, chopped up, and lost forever as bait. So that can't go on forever, um, in my estimation. And this is the process of that. There's publications about the um, birding population. We have uh, to build on the education aspect of this, we have a K to 12 curriculum, Malloy University. You can get it, it's free. If you're a teacher, use it. Um, we all of our I, all of our ed people hear about it. All of our nurses hear about it, um, and so it's uh, pretty intensive. It was put together by two uh, scientists from New Jersey and Delaware. ERDG had it for a year. We brought it to Malloy, and our summer interns uh, at Malloy uh, are always working with horseshoe crabs here at CIRCOM, and uh, gives me a little time to get back out onto the shore. So. I, I, if there are any questions or any comments, I, I apologize if I didn't see any. Um, but uh, if you have any questions, I'm I'm available. Hey, John, thank you. So during your presentation, there were a few questions that popped up in the chat box. Maybe you didn't see it. Okay. Uh, but I'll read them to you and see if you can answer them. Okay. Yeah. By the way, great presentation. Very informative. Thank you. Um, oh, there so you the, go. All right. Yep. So the first first question, uh, does the loss of marine eelgrass as a nursery play a role in the protection and survival of young of the year juvenile horseshoe crabs? Yes. So so it, 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 it can be. Yeah. I mean, the eelgrass. Um, and again, my own personal experience. Um, when I was an undergraduate uh, we used to, my family used to come out to Long Island because we had uh, friends and relatives in Babylon. <clears throat> and uh, the two things you would see on the, on the beaches as we go out to the beach, you're going to Great South Bay or go to uh, or, um, go fishing and grabbing were, and clamming were um, eelgrass washing up onto the shore and that they would have to hire trucks in the community to kind of like take it away or use it for fertilizer or whatever they would do with it, but it would be piled up. And then in there, there'd be horseshoe crabs. Mm. So yes, I mean, the eelgrass, um, though I think um, there's been quite a bit of work by NOAA uh, on Long Island. And I think the, the decline in acreage, I think has been reduced a bit. Uh, I don't have, I don't have my, uh, finger on the pulse of the, the latest work being done. And I'm not sure what was being done during the last three years in the pandemic. Um, so, but I can tell you, it is the kind of habitat that horseshoe crabs move through, eelgrass areas. And, um, and eelgrass, the importance of eelgrass is, is in the sediment. I mean, these are submerged aquatic vegetation. Any submerged aquatic vegetation has to have they all grow by rhizomes and rhizomous plants are very important in holding whatever constituents they grow in, sand, sediment, muds. Um, and um, so the answer is yes. I, I don't have a particular answer. I think there should be a heck of a lot more investigative work being done there. And, um, and if you know a politician and they're looking for a project, I, I would I wouldn't spend it on, um, and again, this is a personal preference, so take it for what it's worth, but uh, 
I know we're putting a lot of attention into plastic at this point. Um, maybe we need to kind of re uh, re evaluate the priorities and go back into looking at the basic ecological functioning of the estuary. Uh, it's not done on a routine basis. There hasn't yeah. been an inventory of invertebrate species in along the Long Island coast since um, back when Stony Brook was involved with uh, Jerry Schubel when he was the director of um, the Marine Science Center at Stony Brook. We're talking about 25, 30 years already. Mm. So that type of thing needs to be recurrent or, you know, even if it's on a three to five year cycle. We're doing an inventory right now on, on phytoplankton, not because of hazardous algal growth, which is, again, gets attention because it's considered to be a problem. Um, but the idea of, of the biological diversity of phytoplankton is what supports biological diversity of the overall ecosystem in estuaries. Mm -hmm. So eelgrass is a major one. It's mm -hmm. a macrophyte, you know, it, it needs to be, needs a lot more attention. Great, thank you. Uh, another question. Um, this looks like it comes from a school teacher. I participated in a horseshoe crab tagging and census program as an environmental science teacher with students in the late 90s. It was part of a data collection effort to support a moratorium on the harvest of horseshoe crabs. What is the status of any horseshoe crab harvest moratoriums in our region? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> the, hmm. the reduction in numbers, I don't know what inventory you worked on, or, or, but the idea is that you can still get a permit to go harvesting horseshoe crabs for bait. Hmm. Simple as that. And yep. it's the number is 135,000. Now, of course, you got to count them. And the, the fish, the person who has the permit says, I only collected 10 or 500 or 1,000. And so mm -hmm. that, that's fine. You know, it, it, that is some kind of record. But, it, you know, we, we, the, there's an, an old, old adage uh, that we used to use in the, in the Park Service in Jamaica Bay because, um, the state for many years wanted to take clams out of Jamaica Bay because they're so productive, they're so prevalent, and, um, and there's a, a very strong, healthy population of hard shell clams there. <clears throat> and we said, well, you can't. It's, hmm. in, it's inside the national park, and that's considered part of the natural resources. So they said, well, how, how much is there? I said, well, we, we know they're there, we've done some studies. But the way we know that there's a problem is when it's illegally, when people get caught illegally harvesting with your law enforcement, which is the best thing that, that can mm. happen. And so, and they actually caught several people, a couple of people did jail time are taking clams out of Jamaica Bay. Huh. Because wow. it's, very, it's very profitable, you know, a yeah. single bush, bushel of, of clams, for example, it goes for several hundred dollars, right? And if you take get fifty to a hundred bushels, you know it's the math decent. is pretty straightforward. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. Uh, another question: How many eggs can one female lay in one spawning season? Um, the literature is a little vague on the ends of this, but somewhere between eighty and one hundred twenty thousand. Okay. So it could be any, uh, I've heard, you know, people say maximum 88. We've had spawns of, in the lab of over 200,000. But, wow. you know, mm. in, but it depends on how gravid and how, if the female is mature enough. Again, if the larger the female, the more eggs. Mm -hmm. um, another question. How long is the crab out of the water during the blood drawing process? Does it have any stressful impacts to the crab? Well, um, anytime the animal is um, taken out, uh, it has to be covered under a permit. You have to have a permit to do that. And the permits are, are very uh, specific that you try to bring the animal back as soon as possible. And uh, if the animal is returned, certainly within a maximum 
uh, I think it's 72 hours <coughs> that the, the permits are allowed. Um, and I don't know the population. New York State says that they don't really uh, issue permits for blood uh, letting. Um, so you have to kind of go to Massachusetts or um, further closer to uh, Delaware Bay. Uh, but we've had animals um, out of the water uh, for as long as, long as the, the, um, the book gills don't dry out, the animal is, uh, there is no indication of a time frame. Uh, now, stress is an, another story. How you determine stress is if you see, if, certainly in captivity, if the animal uh, dies, then you, you can say, well, something did that, but there is natural mortality as well. There has never been a, a season where we didn't bring adult crabs into the lab. We actually put them into a, a, a one particular trough and hold on to them for about a week there to get them to acclimate. <clears throat> and um, we, we lose a few, you know, mm -hmm. one to two, maybe 5% maximum um, on 50 to 100 animals that we gather up. Um, and then uh, we don't know their, their actual age at some point, and we feed them, we take care of them, uh, and the water quality is outstanding because we have we have absolutely pure water quality from our wells. We have the only saltwater wells, actually. We have mm. three of them, and that's very important. Um, so th there is rule of thumb is we try not to keep the animals out of water. Uh, any, for any length of time uh, where the book gills would dry out. So, you know, that could happen immediately in two or three days. Uh, but if it's in water, whatever the conditions might be, um, and certainly uh, waters that have the same tide conditions, pH, dissolved oxygen, all the same parameters that we're looking at and temperature, especially in the oceans or in the, not the oceans in the estuaries then um the animals could be um you know there for longer periods of time a week or two and then if you're in a laboratory situation they have to be fed and so we usually um, never go more than a week without having enough of uh, we kind of recycle uh fish or material that comes from food places where they, they instead of disposing them, you say, give it to us because, you know, it's still good. It's just that the, the Food and Drug Administration, you don't have fish on, on the, out there on ice for more than a day or something. So mm. they, if they, instead of throwing them away, well, you know, we, we'll recycle them. So we, and we put them in a freezer and hold on to them to take care of um, the horse it, there's a comment here, I guess, in relation to that question. Uh, it's someone said that they read in Audubon and National Wildlife magazines that the bleeding of horseshoe crabs does weaken the individual too, at times, to a point of death. Recovery time is long and leaves the individu individual crab susceptible to predation. Any thoughts on that? Scientific literature doesn't say that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, I mean that that could, that certainly could be an opinion, and it certainly yeah. could, could be stated as as an observation. Mm -hmm. And if it comes, in, you know, look, Audubon Journal is not a peer reviewed journal. If there's peer reviewed journal of scientific work, I would know it and I would see it. I, I have not seen that. There have some papers that have said they they've simulated um, the bleeding process, and they have a variety of things. But the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission identifies mortality rates overall in the bleeding process. And you can read their annual report for the past 15 years. Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission has indicated that the mortality is identified as 15% um, of the total population of horseshoe crabs that are removed. Uh, and you know, that, that hasn't changed any. So the populations in just every state except New York mm -hmm. is stable and in growing. New York is the only one identified as poor in its management aspect. So um, this, I guess, is a question for me. 
Great presentation, John. Very thorough. Very thorough. I know several people who wanted to attend today but couldn't because of the timing. Will the video of the lecture be available? And the answer is yes. It will be available on our, it is being recorded. It will be available on our YouTube page in the coming days. So everyone who, everyone who couldn't be here today will be able to view the entire presentation in the next few days. And then there's also an, another comment here. Uh, amazing presentation. Thank you so much, John. Um, so anyway. If I, could, if I could just mention, Frank, uh, yep. that uh, you can reach me. You can send me an email, jtanacredi yep. at malloy.edu. I usually, I, I apologize in advance if I don't get back to you in 24 hours, but mm -hmm. I definitely get back to you and uh, whatever your comments might be. And if um, you have an interest, um, once we get started into the summer, because we're kind of uh, at a just a quiet stage of fixing and repairing and, and maintaining um, the lab, and interested in coming out and seeing what we do at CIRCOM uh, at Malloy University, just use that jtanacredi at malloy.edu and we can work out something maybe in June or July and you can come out. And if you really, 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 really care about horseshoe crabs and you volunteer to help out in the inventory, um, we would welcome that. We just have a couple of little pieces of paper that have to be taken care of. But other than that, um, uh, we just want uh, dedication and conscientiousness. Fantastic. Thanks, John. Just as a reminder from SOFO's end, on Thursday, May 19th at 9 o'clock, SOFO will be conducting a citizen science survey with Cornell Crop of Extensions, Horseshoe Crab Monitoring Program, and assisting tagging horseshoe crabs for management and conservation purposes. So if anybody's interested in joining SOFO for that, uh, you know, be, be on the lookout on our website and contact us, and then you can join in on that program. Other than that, that's all the questions for now, John. I just want to thank you again for for taking the time and just thanking you for all your efforts in, in the conservation uh, of this wonderful animal. And, and before you leave, <laughs> a question that I have in mind, what makes the horseshoe crab uh, so resilient for five mass extinctions? Has there, has there been any study as to why the horseshoe crab is one of the only living fossils, if not the only li living fossil from you know all these mass extinctions is there any uh, answer the, to that uh well if there was an answer that was um corroborated and reputable it would probably be a <laughs> nobel prize but i, I can tell <laughs> you the, the the people that do work on that uh like niles eldridge is involved says one is the simplicity and at the same time uh, he notes due to the, this complexity. And that sounds like mm. it's counted to one another, but the, the reproductive process, the, the blood relationship, remember that their blood, uh, hemocyanin is their hemoglobin. And that in those organisms, and those, these are invertebrates, uh, have helped in some kind of uh, resilience in, in actuality because they're, they don't clot like a, like we have with archive. There is a kind of a gelling that takes place, but they have to fight against disease as well. I mean, they're you know living things on the planet. There would be or uh, microbes, bacterial, fungi, host of things. We're doing a. We started a small project uh, with, with um, Westchester University and with Fordham, and we hope to build on that. We have uh, a group of visiting scientists um, that that work on horseshoe crabs and have been some of those people that were in that uh, one slide that we're going to be looking at uh, again it's eDNA it's obviously it's the technological you know investigative advance that's so important and we want to look at we've done a preliminary project on eDNA on on the uh, microbiome that covers horseshoe crabs and we just we just had it in our paper and it's pretty interesting. It's pretty diverse. There's a lot of fungi and other types of nitrogen bacteria, which you would think it would be important because they're in sediments that are in the denitrification process, in anaerobic environments. So there's a lot more to go there, and um, and it's pretty pretty interesting and still exciting. Hasn't gotten boring. Yeah. <laughs> Fascinating stuff, John. I can't thank you enough. Appreciate all right. the, all the Maybe. effort. 
Thank you so much. Doing a great job. So far, it's terrific. I really appreciate it. Thanks, John. Have a great day, everyone. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks again, John. Take care. Take care. Be well. Thank you.